It's the middle of March in the eastern Carpathians of Transylvania. It seems that winter never wants to end. But the heavy snowfall can't hide the arrival of spring. There are many signs of it coming. The snow slowly melts, giving way to life. The hillside opposite is full of features created by human farming. This is a landscape managed by people for subsistence. They've managed it in much the same way for hundreds of years. Small ploughed arable plots are the first to absorb the warmth of stronger sunlight. The snow disappears in just a few days. Everyone gets ready for the arrival of spring. Peter Tonko farms here with his wife, Erzibet. They live down in the valley with their three children, and together they form a cohesive unit, typical of farming families in this area. Traditional farming is still viable, but struggling for survival in a rapidly changing world. Peter and his family clear the hay meadow, this will make the harvest easier. Ant hills are flattened out and even repositioned as boundary markers between the neighboring plots. The cleared meadow will assist the grass to grow quicker and taller and make the mowing easier. What you see here is in fact mountain gardening. Almost every centimetre of land is carefully managed. But in Transylvania, unlike domestic gardening, this happens on the scale of hundreds of square kilometres and is done by thousands of people. Meanwhile, on the opposite slope, Peter's neighbours, the Lardeau family, are spreading manure that was unloaded a few days ago. They use a horse and an upside-down harrow weighted with wood to break up the pieces of dung. These are what they call inner meadows, which are closer to the bottom of the valley, near the farmsteads. They are fertilized every two or three years with manure, unlike the higher meadows. The effect is obvious. The fertilized meadows are quicker to become green and the harvest will be bigger too. As a result, these meadows will have a second harvest. On the lower meadows, the melting snows form temporary wetlands. It's night time. A female great crested newt is heading towards a shallow pond to find a mate and lay her eggs. She's the model of determination and is one of the most ancient looking creatures in this area. Common frogs appear, as if from nowhere, in the shallow waters of the meadows. After a four month hibernation, they come as quickly as they can without feeding. Males search for females, hug them and try to hold on until the females have laid their eggs in clumps. In a few days, these frogs will have gone. They spread out in the meadows in search of food. More frogs are next. Males turn a spectacular blue in the breeding season. 
It's not a result of fights between the males, but is caused by lymph glands under the skin. The purpose of this unusual colour is still a mystery. According to studies, the colour changes with the weather and the time of day, and there's great variation between individuals. In clear weather, the surface of the water appears intensely blue. Could the frogs be using camouflage as protection from predators? Certainly, bluer males seem to breed more successfully. Males recognize each other by touching, or more precisely, by the croaking sound they make when touched. Storks return from their migration in Africa and feed their young from the plentiful animal life in the hay meadows. The arrival of the cuckoo shows that summer is not far away. Up in the mountains, grape hyacinths cover the meadows. Barbara Knowles is a biologist and a specialist in science policy. The hay meadows in this part of Transylvania are not only incredibly beautiful, but they're also really rich in wildlife. And this is one of the things that really attracted me to Transylvania when I first came here. I was just amazed at the sheer variety of life that exists in these meadows. And compared to an English hay meadow, um, they're just as astonishingly varied. In England, we lost 97% of our hay meadows since the 1940s, and the meadows that remain are very intensively farmed. The intensive farming involves putting a large quantity of artificial fertilizers on the meadow. The grasses are often reseeded, and as a result, the meadows contain very rich, lush grasses, but only a very few varieties, and almost no flowers. So there are tiny patches of English meadow now, heavily protected, where you find one or two orchids or other rare flowers. And they're prized, a lot of money is spent on them, um, on conserving and restoring tiny patches of meadow. Whereas here, everywhere you look in Transylvania, you find meadows which each individual one contains hundreds of different types of flowers, and with those flowers come a huge variety of other types of life. The eastern pusk flower is normally only found in the lowland plains. Here, in the forested alpine region, this flower benefits from the grassy open spaces which are maintained by farming. A more common relative of this species is the mountain pusk flower. There are still thriving farm communities in this area. In this village show, they display the beauty, strength and productivity of their animals. Rich flower meadows are provided for the cows, who give back milk and meat. The ability of farmers to sell their products, now and in the future, is the key to the survival of species-rich hay meadows. Without cows, there will be no more meadows. In May, the lower meadows display their spectacular flowers. Snake's head fritillary is typical in floodplain hay meadows with peaty soil. The globe flower is abundant on wet meadows. Siberian iris is a beautiful rarity associated with fens. This flower doesn't look very promising at first sight, but a closer look reveals the beautiful flowers of a bug orchid, named after the smelly stink bug. A beautiful relative is the early spotted orchid. Temporary ponds are key habitats in this area. Laszlo Demeter is a biologist He's been studying the wildlife of temporary ponds for a decade. This is a female Honko fairy shrimp that's known in only a handful of sites in Central and Eastern Europe. 
It's named after a Hungarian zoologist. The body shape of fairy shrimp evolved more than 500 million years ago and has changed very little since then. Just like the ancient farming system practiced in the surrounding landscape, these creatures are living fossils. They have lobed legs with multiple functions, breathing, swimming and feeding. They filter particles, algae and bacteria, out of the water as food. At the base of the abdomen is the egg sac. It's constantly moved by the mother to aerate her eggs. These eggs are designed to survive many years in harsh conditions. They can withstand heat, cold and dehydration. They've adapted so perfectly to temporary ponds that their eggs need the ponds to be completely dry in the summer, then refilled with water the next spring so they can hatch. Many ponds will dry out in the late spring and are used as hay meadows later in the year. Mowing reduces the shade, shortens the wet period and causes the pond to dry out completely. This allows the shrimps to complete their life cycle. There are no fairy shrimp in the damp, shaded pools. In the shallow ponds, Life is short, but you are not allowed to die. You're eaten first. A tadpole shrimp is eating a fairy shrimp. This is an exuvium, the old shed skin of a tadpole shrimp. It's the end of May. In the mountains, the grass is growing relentlessly. We meet 90-year-old Geza Lado. He's making rake teeth out of ash wood. He escaped from a Russian prison in the Second World War, traveled a thousand kilometers from Poland on foot and arrived back home here in Transylvania. Peter's other neighbour, Bela Tonko and his son, are fixing fences. Fences are very important features, typical for this mountain area, although rare in the rest of Transylvania. As almost every piece of land is private property, hay meadows and pastures are side by side. Fences protect the hay meadows from grazing and prevent the animals from wandering away. The preservation of these meadows in Transylvania and their continued existence really relies on the existence of traditional farming. And the continuation of that farming is so important, I think, here. The variety comes from the patchwork of different types of meadow. Um, each, own, each small plot is owned by an individual farmer and their family. And the different types of, and the different times of management of each small parcel of land creates the mosaic landscape that you can see here and the huge diversity of plant life and animal life. It's time to let the cows out onto the summer pastures. Peter and his family move the milking and cheese making equipment to the summer house, which is at the bottom of the slope that serves as their cow pasture. The summer pastures of many families are so far away that the family moves up to the mountains with the animals for the whole summer. Originally, most people did this, but now only a few carry on the tradition. We meet Baylor and his family 
on their way up to the pasture, along with their tools and animals. Their summer house is just next to Peter's. Peter's pasture is only half an hour's walk from home, so during summer they all walk up every evening, milk the cows and spend the night there. Next morning they milk the animals again, return home to take care of the rest of the household chores and to make some more hay. Sometimes they also make cheese. These are happy cows. They just started their summer holiday in the upper pasture. This year, the start of summer is very wet. On the lower meadows, storks wait for the rain to stop. They stand in a temporary pond and are wet right down to their underwear. But as evening comes, the weather improves. Our storks find some haystacks that make them very happy. They dry their wings, jump and dance. Haystacks remind them of their nests, triggering behaviours related to nest building and guarding the nest. These are young storks. They stay in flocks for the whole summer as they do in Africa. The heavy rain leads to floods in the mountains. These break bridges, erode banks and wash away roads. Peter's yard was flooded too. Where waters block the track, people open their courtyards so that everybody can pass through. As he saw us approaching the flooded path, this man left the gate open for us. We meet Erzabet and the children coming down from the pasture. The flood happened during the night, but luckily the family were all together and no one was hurt. Men immediately start repairing the bridges and roads. Jolt Molnar is a plant ecologist from neighbouring Hungary. He's been studying local knowledge of plants in this area for more than 10 years, and he explains how they manage hay meadows here. He puts all this local knowledge into a global context. In order to understand the hay meadows of Gimes, we first need to know about the structure of this landscape. Gimes lies in the mountains, it is composed of valleys. On the bottom of each valley lies a stream, and the settlements have developed along the streams. This place is called Lock Place, meaning a flat place along a stream. Here the houses are not organized into streets, their distribution is very loose. Between the houses are meadows and potato fields. If we go a bit higher on the slopes, we find a zone that until a few decades ago was mostly arable land. People cultivated barley, oat, but as trade developed, they abandoned these fields and transformed them into hay meadows. These are the so-called inner meadows, as opposed to the outer meadows. The main characteristic of the inner meadows is that they yield more grass. It is composed of tall grass species, such as this grass called imola, golden oat grass in English. Approximately 15-20 species of tall grasses occur in Gimes, and local people don't distinguish them, but use a common name for this group, imola. Tall oat grass is the most typical for these inner meadows. The hay is most suitable for horses. Two more herbs are worth noting in these meadows. 
One is sage, known locally as lambfoot, and red clover, called horse clover. The biodiversity of these meadows is much lower than in the outer meadows, because they are manured for increased productivity and partly because these are secondary grasslands formed after the abandonment of arable fields. But the smaller biodiversity is relative, because even here the number of herbaceous plants is much larger than on an average good meadow in Western Europe. These species are mostly generalist, they tolerate fertilizing and regular mowing, and in the autumn they will be grazed too. The outer meadows are high up on the mountains. At first sight, you may think this scenery is wild nature. In fact, all of it is managed by people. This is mountain gardening on the landscape scale. In June, the mountain garden is at its most beautiful. The vast majority of meadows in this area are the so-called outer meadows. There are not enough manure to fertilize these meadows, therefore the usage is less intensive. And also they are higher up in the mountains, in a colder climate, and so the grass grows slowly. These meadows are mown only once a year, and the second growth is grazed by the animals in autumn. The outer meadows have a very high species diversity. Some of Europe's most biodiverse hay meadows are here. In the surroundings of Pogányhavas mountain, we found 85 plant species in a 4 by 4 meter area. This is among the highest density of meadow plants in Europe. On average, there are 40, 50, 60 species on a few square meters on such meadows. But here we can find many protected plants many orchid species and other high mountain species that represent a special natural treasure. This is because these areas are not overused, they are managed traditionally. These meadows were created in the past 200 years, so they are relatively young, ecologically speaking, they are not so eroded. In parts of this landscape, the trees were always sparse enough to allow these herbaceous species to survive in the past thousands of years and these species form new communities in the past 200 years and now they are threatened by the transformation of agriculture because there is a risk that their management will stop and then they will be quickly overgrown by forest. The first step is the accumulation of dead plant material because the unmown grass decomposes only slowly and seeds cannot germinate and so species number decreases. At the same time bushes appear and in a few decades they transform into a forest. Moonwort is an ancient fern, a Methuselah of dinosaur times, which survives in this wealth of colours. Its spores are held in grape-like clusters on the fertile part of the leaf. The spectacular yet toxic false helleborine is frequent, but its relative the black false hellebore is very rare. Its fleshy flowers attract hundreds of insects, mostly small flies and wasps. The breeze carries clouds of pollen into the air. Grasses are slowly ripening. By the end of June and early July, they're ready to mow. Work starts first on the inner meadows and progresses to the outer ones. The best time for mowing is at dawn. The dew makes it much easier to cut the grass. Due to manuring and the fertile soil, long grasses are dominant on the inner meadows. 
and they dry out faster. Mowing here should start as early in the morning as possible to ensure the maximum time before the dew disappears. The outer meadows have shorter and denser vegetation. This holds the dew until later, allowing a longer time for the mow. This is why people say, jokingly, that dawn comes earlier on the inner meadows. There's a fundamental contradiction, I think, in the, both the national and European policy on farmlands and environment protection which is that the policy aims at, on the one hand, to increase the economic efficiency of farming here and indeed across Europe, but on the other hand, to protect and preserve biodiversity. And I think really it's almost impossible to do those two things at the same time. Experienced mowers soon synchronise to maximise their efforts. So what would be important here is to redefine what we mean by efficiency in terms of agriculture. So efficiency not just in purely economic terms, when you would um, economically it would be much better to remove the small patchwork of fields, replace them with a much larger single meadows, pastures, single arable fields but instead to recognise that this small patchwork actually provides a huge number of environmental goods and services which we all benefit from, although at the moment we can't put an economic value to these things. So for example, the diversity of plant life in itself provides a great deal of resilience of this area to changes such as climate change, whereas the monocultures which exist in Western Europe are much, much more um, liable to, to damage from different climatic events. The different variety of plant life that's seen in these meadows provides really nutritious food for the cattle, the sheep, the horses, the other animals that rely on the hay that's produced from these meadows. We can also calculate that meadows of this sort collect a lot of carbon dioxide from the air and store that carbon underground. Um, permanent grasslands like these are fantastic carbon stores and this is now something that's understood to have a great economic value in times of climate change. So the policies at the both the European level and the, the, the local level should be redesigned to reflect the fact that the value of these meadows lies not just in the economic output of the small farms that maintain them, but also in all these other um, environmental goods and services that are being provided. In the mountains, until a few years ago, mowing was only done by hand scythe. In the lower areas, mechanisation started almost three decades earlier. Now many people have small mowing machines, but hand mowing is also frequently done. Hand mowing is a craft, a skill learnt by men from their adolescence. The blade should be razor sharp and the whole scythe adjusted to suit the user's body. It makes muscles as tough as rope. During mowing, people get in very close contact with the grass. That's the basis of their livelihood. Basically all the land is touched inch by inch and the person doing the mowing feels the strength of the grass, its growth direction and smell. Muscle power is less important than a good technique. It's vital to learn an efficient way of moving the scythe and to master the art of blade sharpening. Flattening the blade with a hammer 
is essential to produce a razor-sharp edge. This is the art of a true blacksmith. Old people enjoy telling stories of their mowing mastery when they were younger. Peter and his family are spreading the grass that was mown this morning. This allows it to dry faster. The perfect raking technique is demonstrated by five-year-old Mate. Now the hay must be turned over. Considering the variety of plants here, we could say that the inner meadows are less diverse meadows. But it is worth looking at this in a landscape context. These meadows produce good quality hay for the animals from the second mowing. If we start restricting the manuring to increase the biodiversity, the yield would decrease. This would put pressure on animal husbandry in this area and as a consequence more of the outer meadows would be abandoned whose biodiversity is so important from a nature conservation perspective. Consequently, we need to keep the balance between the inner meadows that are manured and the outer meadows with outstanding biodiversity. Next, they use branches to carry the haystacks down the hill. Mowing and haymaking is the longest agricultural activity of the year, extending from June to September. There are always patches left undisturbed, so there's plenty of time and space for wildlife to feed, grow and reproduce. The abundance of grasshoppers is astonishing. Their sound is often similar to scythe sharpening or the warning of a rattlesnake. Grasshoppers love to eat herbs. Apart from cows, they're the biggest consumers of grass in this landscape. In midsummer, flowers become a scarce resource. If you don't want to share your lunch, you must scare away your competitors. The eye spots on the wings of this brown butterfly are designed to create the impression of a larger, more fearsome creature. She's flapping her wings repeatedly to scare away other insects. On this great globe thistle, the less scary looking creatures are forced to retreat to the lower part of the plant. The bright colours of this burnet moth tell predators that it's distasteful and toxic. It contains hydrogen cyanide. Cicadas are also abundant.
They use their tube-like mouth parts to suck juices from the plants. Harvestman spiders don't make webs. They actively hunt small invertebrates. In hunting, this wasp spider is a perfectionist. She's caught a green grasshopper in her web. She quickly wrapped it with unbreakable silk to immobilize it. She's a gourmand. She takes her time, carefully cleaning her legs in preparation. She injects her meal with a deadly venom to paralyze it and an enzyme to dissolve the proteins. Dinner will soon be ready. Sun and wind dry the grass. Peter and Erzabet are helping to collect hay for a neighbour. George Prejma is 80 years old. If we look at farming in this area, we see an apparently simple system. But I always say that it is not simple, but great, because people use exactly the potential that this landscape has to offer. And they can use this potential so efficiently because they know this landscape very well. Not only do they know the land as a geographical map, but they also know plants, animals, vegetation types, habitats, soil types, water types, rocks. In other words, they have a very rich knowledge on nature. Just to list a few examples, in this area there are about 450 species of white plants that local people could possibly perceive. And they can name more than 60% of these. They distinguish more than 130 types of vegetation, habitat types, soil types, from wet ones to the rocky ones, different types of grasslands and forests. A number that, according to our international review, is the largest ever recorded in the world for a small community. So people possess an outstanding knowledge about nature. And when we are talking about nature conservation management, we cannot ignore this knowledge. It would not work to introduce nature conservation practices from the Netherlands or Germany to protect nature here. On the contrary, we have to understand the details of local knowledge. And based on this knowledge, we should help develop not nature conservation management, but farming systems that are adjusted to this landscape and are not destructive, but would provide sustainable use of natural resources for the people of Gimesh. The farming system here is extremely sensitive to the land and the farmers apply very small amounts of fertilizer, only animal manure. They cut, they mow the meadows once or twice a year depending on how far away they are from the village. And this combination of very low intensity farming and um, small patchwork really makes a perfect system for, for wildlife. Uh, the reason being that the, um, each individual farmer makes, makes a choice about when to mow the, the meadow um, according to his own idiosyncratic uh, plans. And so each meadow is cut at a different time. The grass is therefore at different lengths on different small patches of land. This is great for birds such as storks, for example, which forage um, in the short grass 
and then there are other birds and other animals which prefer to live in the long grass. So at any time of, uh, of the spring or the summer or the autumn, you will find both long grass, short grass, different types of foliage and flowers for the insects, for the birds and so on. This is a perfect management system for nature. It would be impossible for a government to afford to pay people to manage land on this scale and in, in this way, but the farmers are providing this service for absolutely nothing. Um, what's more, they're also feeding themselves and their families on, on the land. This is what makes it, to me, seem so absurd that at least three million of the four million farmers in Romania have um, such small patches of land that they're not eligible for agri-environment payments. And yet it's these three million really small farmers who are the ones that are providing the fantastic services for the environment and for wildlife. And these are the farmers that I think should be supported. The branches are now fully loaded with hay. The entire stack is dragged down to the barn and the owner invites everybody for a well-deserved picnic. An emblematic bird of these non-intensive hay meadows is the corncrake. At the edge of a wet hay meadow, we set up a hide to film this secretive bird. Males are territorial and they're ready to fight any potential competitor. We use a recording of a male corncrake to attract a real bird. After a while, we hear a distant reply. Is it the wind moving the grasses? Mowing maintains the meadows where the corncrakes live. However, very early mechanised mowing in large areas endangers their reproduction because the birds nest in the grass and it's difficult to mow without harming their nests and their chicks. The protection of the corncrake has become an international priority. The present measures focus on delaying the onset of mowing, which creates problems for traditional farmers. Instead of these new heavy-handed regulations, the support of small-scale mowing would protect the corncrakes too. Gergely Rodic moved to Transylvania from neighbouring Hungary in 2006 and he runs a small rural development association in this area. Romania has only 4% of the EU population but 20% of the farming families in the EU and Romania has almost 30% of the farm units in Europe which is a huge percentage. So in this country it is very important that we succeed in developing regulations that are different from pan-European regulations in some issues. When we asked local people about the difference between hay from the first and second mowing, they say it's like the difference between rye bread and cake. So the second cut is given to calves, pigs, generally to the younger animals. Sometimes in rainy years the second cut is delayed until September. This year's very wet summer made a very good second cut. One characteristic of this area is the lack of a common village herd. Instead, every family or groups of families fence a mountain slope and this is used as pasture. 
In the case of these common pastures, every member has the right to keep a certain number of animals. These cows spend the night in the valley bottom, they are milked there in the evening and morning, and then they are left free in the pasture where they graze the whole day long. At about 8 o'clock in the evening, the cows return to the village and are milked again. Pastures are on the steepest, often south-facing slopes, and can often be recognised by the horizontal paths caused by the animals. Because they regularly graze, manure and trample the grass, pastures have less biodiversity than meadows. There are higher mountain pastures from which cows do not return home to the village each day. These are higher up in the mountains, a large area is fenced and the cows of several families graze there. All the cows are kept in one stable. Families take turn milking for a period of time, which depends on how many cows they own and how much milk they yield. The family keeps the milk from this period. They stay for five days or two weeks, and then it is the turn of the next family to start milking the cows and making the cheese. This is necessary because there is no common herd, and the summer is the time of haymaking when all hands are needed, and so there is no capacity to take care of the cows permanently. This is in fact a highly efficient labor management. Families don't need to go home with their cows every day and they don't need to be separated from the community with their cows. It's a rainy morning and Erzsébet is making cheese. It is particularly important that the farmers can sell milk. In other words, we need to create a market for the milk. And worst of all are the new conditions created when Romania joined the EU. The introduction of very many new regulations, including many food hygiene rules in the milk sector. One of them is the bacterial count, the other is the somatic cell count. Producers have to meet such low levels of contaminants, it requires totally new ways of production, storage and transport. Agriculture would be better and more people would continue farming if there was a slaughterhouse here so that if I raise a calf, I can be sure that I can sell it. Now I have to keep it longer, so that eventually somebody will buy it, and at a price of the buyer's choice. If you say to him, come on, buy my animal, he will give the lowest possible price. Autumn is in the air, and on the higher meadows, there's a risk of frost or snow. Because of the unusually rainy summer, Haymaking is late this year. The family who owns this meadow need the help and cooperation of the entire community to get the job done in time. This meadow is too far from their barn at home in the valley, so hay is collected and stored in a smaller mountain barn. When we ask Gimesh people how do they know so many plants, where did they learn it, it turns out that the source is not the books, TV, nor the Hungarian tourists, but their own experience. They say that nature explained herself. Or they say, experience wrote experience. This means that they spend so much time in nature that they simply get to know it. Of course, they learn a large amount from their parents and grandparents, but a very large part of their knowledge is personal experience. Now, where does this experience come from? We try to estimate with our friends in Gimesh how much time they spend outdoors during a year. This number is 210 days. This is the amount of time they spend in the nature per year. I heard a statistic from Hungary where this number is 15 days. An average Hungarian citizen spends 15 days in the open air. And this is not even time spent in nature, 
but it includes time spent at the bus stop too. Well, the difference between 15 days and 210 days gives the amount of knowledge to Dimash people that is almost unimaginable to us. The sun has almost gone when the owner ties the last haystack and the horse drags it to the barn. It's late summer in the meadows. This mosaic landscape is an ideal hunting ground for birds of prey. Deeper ponds still have plenty of water, though from a distance, the thick vegetation is the only clue that indicates their presence. The ponds hide hundreds of small dragons. They are newt larvae, differing in appearance from the adults by their fan-like gills. Although older larvae have lungs too, the gills allow them to spend longer underwater, hunting or resting. Their character and appearance is a combination of angel and bloodhound. Ottila Sharig is a young farmer. He's organized a haymaking festival. The idea of the haymaking festival came to me because very many young people have left the village. The older generations are getting older and there is nobody to manage these excellent meadows. I thought that if we made hay with tourists, we could manage these meadows. So that if the young people change their mind in four or five years, or if life forces them to return home and make a living out of farming, they wouldn't have to start clearing the meadows, but would have managed meadows to start with. Autumn crocuses cover the meadows, a sure sign of the end of summer. The herd is moved from the pastures. Only now are the cows allowed to graze here. They use up the remaining grass after the second mowing. By the time the grass of mountain pastures have been fully grazed, the aftermath of the outer meadows is growing and the animals are allowed to graze on these areas. These areas are also called autumning places. Cows are here from September to October or early November, and then they are moved to the village stables for the winter. Crops are harvested and arable fields are cleared and ploughed. Winter begins with a lot of snow.
Partridges look for food underneath the snow. When the snow is deep, they search the open ground beside the roads. We spotted this flock from the car. Rarities appear. A rough-legged buzzard watches for voles. Beneath the snow, rodents are active even during winter. A short-eared owl is a very rare winter visitor here. Unlike most owls, it's hunting during the day and spends a lot of time on the ground. The stillness of winter settles on the meadows. But people get no rest in the mountains. This is the time for manuring. It's carried up to the steep slopes on sledges, which avoids any damage to the grass. As snow melts in the spring, it filters nutrients gradually into the soil. Manure represents a feast for the birds, because it contains plenty of maggots and worms. A ring oozle can hardly wait to have his dinner. The field fair is less shy. Sooner or later, all the hay ends up at home and is gradually eaten by the animals. Peter is bringing a new load of hay from the mountain barn. Driving the horses to haul nearly a ton weight on the steep snowy slopes requires skills accumulated over many years. Baylor is also bringing hay from his outer meadow barn. They unload it in the home barn. This is the best way to warm up on a chilly day. By the time they finish, more snow arrives. In this area, hundreds of people do the same thing at this time of year. A busy road follows the main valley a few kilometers downstream. Carts full of hay are a common sight here in winter. Drivers don't fully understand what's happening. They only see a medieval parade of backwardness, just another nuisance like the potholes in the road. Traditional farming is still practiced, but it's declining rapidly. At the moment, the bias is towards intensive agriculture. To protect the hay meadows, with their outstanding biodiversity, we must also support the small-scale farmers. We should reward them for their stewardship of this precious environment and create the possibility for them 
to sell their products at a fair price. The long-term viability of this way of life is in the hands of policymakers, markets and consumers. In other words, all of us. <laughs>